welcome to the second annual summit on civic readiness, Civics Gets Real, Teaching Civic Readiness Amid Increased Political Conflict. We're pleased to have you join us today for this kickoff event to the Democracy Ready New York Coalition's New York Civic Learning Week webinar series. Hello, I'm Tom Bailey, president of Teachers College, Columbia University. I'm delighted to welcome you to the second annual summit on civic readiness, taking place during New York Civic Learning Week. I want to thank our hosts for this program, Democracy Ready New York Coalition and the Center for Educational Equity at Teachers College, which leads this work and has brought together this powerful coalition. As many of you know, Teachers College is a graduate school devoted to empowering committed learners and leaders to build a smarter, healthier, more just and equitable world through multidisciplinary knowledge creation, policy engagement, and practice innovations across education, psychology, and health. If this sounds like a mission statement, well, it is. And what I love about today's program is that it embodies our mission by bringing together a cross-section of policymakers, community partners, teachers, students at all levels of their education, and of course, TC faculty. All of us are devoted to preparing students not only to be civic-minded, but also civically active towards the goal of a world that is perhaps above all else just and equitable. Our theme today is Civics Get Real, Teaching Civic Readiness Amid Increased Political Conflict. And as we ramp up here in the U.S. for presidential elections, it almost feels like a cliché to say that stakes have never been higher. Political polarization and conflict have seeped into every aspect of our society, in school board meetings, in classrooms, on college campuses, with debates about what and how we teach, hampering our educators and, of course, ultimately, our students. A functioning democracy demands that as educators, we ensure our students, all students, have the critical skills to engage in civic life and activism, which requires not just history, but also media literacy and knowledge of how we access levers of power. Our role here is to empower students and give them agency. And we are in very good hands today to meet this challenge. We'll first hear remarks from SUNY Chancellor John B. King, whose path of success not only includes serving as U.S. Secretary of Education under President Barack Obama, but also he is a graduate of Teachers College with a Master's of Arts in Teaching of Social Studies and a Doctorate in Education. And then he will be in conversation with the Center for Educational Equity's Michael Rebell. Following that, you'll hear the on-the-ground perspective from school stakeholders and then policymakers. You'll come away with heightened awareness of your rights to civic participation, and that gives me a lot of hope. So let me now turn things over with my gratitude to Michael Rebell, the esteemed executive director of the Center for Educational Equity and professor of law and educational practice here at TC and one of the nation's foremost authorities on the education adequacy movement in the United States, who will formally introduce Chancellor King. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much, President Bailey. Uh, and it is indeed my honor to introduce uh, Chancellor John King, uh, who I have had the pleasure of uh, knowing and working with for many years. Um, and Chancellor King is the head of the uh, State University of New York, which is the largest comprehensive system of higher public higher education in the United States. As has already been mentioned, uh, Chancellor King served in Barack, President Barack Obama's cabinet as the U.S. Secretary of Education, and his service in Washington followed his tenure as New York State's first African-American and first Puerto Rican education commissioner a role in which he oversaw all elementary and secondary schools, as well as public independent and propriety colleges and universities, professional licensure, libraries, museums, and numerous other educational institutions. Uh, prior to his appointment as SUNY Chancellor, uh, Dr. King served 
as president of the Education Trust, a national civil rights nonprofit, which seeks to identify and close opportunity and achievement gaps for students from preschool through college. Chancellor King holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard University, a JD degree from Yale Law School, and as Professor, as President Tom Bailey pointed out, he also holds a doctorate in education from Teachers College. So it is my great pleasure uh, to turn the discussion over to Chancellor King. For the kind introduction, thanks everybody for joining us today. Can't tell you how excited I am to be part of an extraordinary convening centered on a crucial topic peopled by stellar talents. Uh, I want to especially thank Michael Rebell for his gracious invitation and for all that he does to promote educational equity, civic learning and preparedness, and real life solutions to our toughest challenges. As you heard, my name is John King, and my current job in education is serving as the chancellor of the State University of New York. But my first job in education uh, was in the classroom as a social studies teacher in Puerto Rico and in Boston. And so civics has been at core of my educational uh, DNA, uh, which is to say my DNA since I began. And when I say my educational DNA and my actual DNA are one and the same, please understand both my parents were uh, lifelong New York City public school educators. Uh, I spent my entire career in education. My wife has spent her entire adult life in education. So uh, I'm very proud that education is so central to my identity. Uh, and civics have always been a part of my passions. I started out uh, teaching civics when I was first a teacher and have always believed that that must be central to our mission in education. Uh, just this month, SUNY announced its first cohort of 10 civic education and engagement and civil discourse fellows, and I could not be prouder. Uh, Why do we do that? Because it's crucial, and particularly so because at SUNY, we have made U.S. history and civic engagement part of the general education requirement students must fulfill to complete a degree. Uh, everywhere we turn today, sadly, we hear um, so much about workforce, but less about civic readiness. And we really need to hear about both. Uh, while workforce readiness is uh, crucial, it can't be the be all end all. We know that colleges have a responsibility to prepare students for citizenship, to prepare them to be contributing community members, to prepare them to understand the laws and values that have made this nation great and the forces that threaten to undermine that greatness. I'd argue that responsibility is every bit as serious as the need to ensure they can make a good living. In 1947, the Truman Commission on Higher Education recommended that education for civic life should be paramount a paramount goal for colleges and universities. Uh, but today, it's too easy for a student to graduate high school and even college and know very little about how the society they inhabit is supposed to work, nor how it actually does work. Being able to understand that distinction and fighting for the society that operates properly is a fundamental responsibility. And it's not hard to connect the way civic education has fallen out of favor with the way our civic life has deteriorated and our civil discourse has uh, been deeply eroded. The best way to deliver uh, civic learning and to bolster civic education is by incorporating it, I believe, in nearly every class, rather than simply focusing one class in a student's educational career on it. Uh, and we've got to make sure that that civic learning is experiential and hands-on. Young people need to do democracy to understand it. They need to get involved in real issues, offer real solutions, fight for real change, learn to work with those they agree with to find solutions, and work with those whom they disagree with too. They need to see that it's both hard to bring positive change and that it's possible. They need to know how to protest properly and peacefully and how to give others with whom they disagree the space to do so as well. They need to learn about and with 
people who have different backgrounds and experiences and perspectives. That's a fundamental reason that SUNY and New York State are doubling down on diversity, equity, and inclusion and work to broaden the parameters of that inclusion. Uh, we believe experience in diverse settings is fundamental to successful participation in today's diverse American democracy. Now, that means we're working to leverage every tool available under the law in admissions, including, including considering low-income status, first-gen status, adversity students have overcome, AmeriCorps alumni status, and veteran status to advance diversity in our student body. We know our classroom discussions will be better and our communities richer because of diversity. And we're working to diversify who teaches at SUNY and our campus leadership because we know diversity will make our faculty stronger and the research questions we pursue even better. As other states wanna turn back the clock on conscious efforts to engender understanding, empathy, and love, between seemingly disparate groups, we seek to spring forward. For that reason, every SUNY undergraduate is required to complete at least one course that addresses themes of diversity, equity, and inclusion. From the nursing student learning about the tragic reality of racial health disparities and maternal health, to the economic student learning about the awful history of redlining, diversity, equity, and inclusion will make our students learning, whatever their major, deeper and more nuanced. Students also need to be taught the importance of the vote and taught to discern what it is they are voting on, uh, what the different levels of government do and why they matter and how you contribute to them and influence them. They need to understand our history, its glories and its gaps, its triumphs and tragedies. Uh, the SUNY Civic Engagement Fellows I described will coordinate with campus student government members on civic education and engagement. They'll help facilitate curricula on, on civic education engagement. They'll gather and amplify resources to help faculty fulfill the general education requirement around US history and civic engagement. And they'll help inform a civic education and engagement strategic plan. Um, and that's not all we're doing to promote civic education at SUNY, uh, where experiential learning and civics are prioritized separately and together. This year, we are uh, significantly expanding SUNY com uh, SUNY's commitment to public service. We're waiving the application fee for all AmeriCorps alumni. Uh, 15 of our 64 SUNY campuses have earned the designation of AmeriCorps Schools of National Service by offering var various dedicated incentives and support for AmeriCorps participants and alumni, including not only admissions preferences, uh, but one-year enrollment deferral to serve, uh, academic credit for their service, scholarships, and more. Uh, what else? Last year, there was a call to action from the White House and the U.S. Department of Education regarding the National Partnership for Student Success, asking colleges to dedicate at least 15% of their federal work-study funds for community service within the next two years. Of the 26 colleges named as early adopters, nearly half were SUNY campuses. And then there's our FAFSA completion core. Uh, SUNY received a grant of nearly $300,000 from AmeriCorps to launch uh, the initiative, which has begun with 48 students across seven campuses. Uh, as many of you may know, the new FAFSA form, uh, which is the gateway to addressing um, and accessing federal, state, and often institutional financial aid, uh, that new FAFSA form has um, been launched, uh, and it's honestly this year uh, a struggle. Um, in particular, the new form from the U.S. Education Department is simpler, but it's nonetheless unfamiliar to many students and families, and there was a huge delay in the form's release, which has disrupted the financial aid cycle. So our FAFSA Completion Corps members are doing vital work helping prospective students and families complete the FAFSA, and Governor Hochul, and we are working together uh, to make the FAFSA and the New York State Dream Act application uh, universal to make sure that every high school graduate fills out the form uh, and gets uh, access to the financial aid they're entitled to. Um, that FAFSA completion core is going to make sure students get what they 
need for college. Last year in New York, students left $200 million on the table on unclaimed federal financial aid because of not completing the FAFSA. So that's what we're trying to tackle uh, with that important service opportunity for students. So we're doubling down on service because of the difference it can make in the lives of those who are served, uh, but also because of the transformative impact it has on those who serve. Uh, from the military to after-school tutoring, from volunteer firefighters to staffing a food bank or homeless shelter, service deepens our humanity, cultivates empathy, and often causes us to work alongside people who are very different from us, but with whom we share a common noble purpose. It is civics in action. So at SUNY, we're teaching civics, uh, we're funding civics training, and we're offering experiential civics. Uh, when I served as U.S. Secretary of Education under President Obama, I called on our nation's elementary schools, and middle schools, and high schools to make civics an educational requirement for all students. Uh, today, I'm telling you that colleges must also make civics a fundamental part of their offerings and a required one. And to be clear, emphasis on civics is not a partisan issue. Uh, neither Republicans nor Democrats have a monopoly on knowledgeable participation in the public sphere. And the fact that civic knowledge and involvement sometimes is portrayed as partisan might be one of the strongest arguments uh, for a revival in required civics education. Uh, studies have repeatedly borne out the idea that students who receive high quality civics education are more likely to complete college on time. And teaching civics doesn't honestly take even a moment away from the workforce preparation that we know is critical because so many of the skills are the same. Critical thinking and problem solving, patience and tolerance, uh, bridge building through differences uh, of opinion, communication, and teamwork. Why though would students well-trained in civics be more likely to graduate college? I think it's about connection. And I increasingly think lack of connection contributes to an extraordinary percentage of the ills plaguing our society and its people. Good civics is the exploration and explanation of society as a we. It's about how the group strives, how the group interacts, how the group disagrees without fracturing, how the group can compromise on a plan without compromising its values, and even how the group bolsters and supports the individual, even when that individual is out of step with the majority. Good civics, is the story of people working together and the morality tale of what happens when we don't. A good civics is about voting instead of shooting, marching instead of bombing, protesting peacefully, and being peaceful in the face of protests we disagree with. Good civics is about how we care for each other in times of trouble, about funding social safety nets and schools and libraries, and about debating how much the funding ought to be and how it ought to be spent. Good Civics is about coming together to fund a library we can all use, coming together to ban a chemical pollutant no one should use, about building roads we fund together to take us where we need to go. And what we've seen happen as civics went out of fashion or what we've seen happen that force civics out of fashion, the age of I and me, the era of us and they, but not we. The age of tribalism, a time of disconnect and division, an era of selfishness and identity-based indifferences uh, rather than similarities. So today we stand at a crossroads. A nation conceived in compromise is today too full of shouted slogans received by closed ears rather than reasonable statements met with reasonable disagreement. It can't go on, it can't be allowed to go on because it serves no one, because it isolates rather than unifying, because it alienates rather than resonating. The United States of America, if it is to be united, cannot be a nation of us and them, even when we disagree. We must be a we that can remain so, even through disagreement, who understands how a workable democratic system operates, that values institutions and the methods that fairly change institutions, that values differences of opinion, and never treats others with indifference. People need to be taught these lessons. It's our job 
K-12 and in higher education to teach them. Uh, we're certainly seeing what happens when we don't. But I also know what happens when we do, and events like this help me remain confident that we will. So thanks again for letting me join you, and I look forward to the conversation with Michael. Okay, well, thanks very much, Chancellor King. And, uh, you know, you have a unique background, having been uh, at the top of uh, the apex of leadership in both higher education and K-12 education. So um, I'd like to ask you a few questions about each level of our education system and begin with higher education. Uh, I was very pleased to hear about the many steps that uh, SUNY is taking to promote civic uh, readiness um, at the university level. Um, one thing that intrigued me, you particularly mentioned that every student um, must um, um, be civically engaged in U.S. and U.S. history and civics as a graduation requirement. Does that mean there's a specific course that every student must take in order to graduate from SUNY? No, so it's part of a sort of a course distribution requirement that we have. There are a series of areas in which students must have um, exposure. And um, one of those areas is uh, this U.S. history and, and civic engagement. And it's really then identifying courses at each of our campuses that uh, looks at the history of American society, the diversity of individuals who make up our country, the understanding what participation in society and government looks like, has looked like historically, um, and then applying historical and contemporary evidence to, you know, to draw support or um, verifying conclusions. So it's really making sure that students have that exposure. It's one of several areas that are part of our, our general education uh, requirements across SUNY. Okay. Um, well, let me uh, ask about another uh, point that you um, hit on uh, quite in a, quite a focused way, uh, and that's the importance of um, uh, people being able to have respectful conversations with those who have different opinions, those who they may agree. But uh, unfortunately, um, civil discourse doesn't seem to be taking place very well on many of our college campuses around uh, New York State and around the country, uh, especially uh, in the advent of the um, Israel-Hamas war since October 7th. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, how have you been handling this, this great problem of student demonstrations and free speech at SUNY during, during this crisis time? Yeah, look, I, there's no question it's a huge challenge for the higher ed sector. I think, you know, one of the first principles we've tried to apply is to be human um, and to be human about what we're seeing, uh, to be able to, to say clearly and emphatically that the horrific Hamas terrorist attack on October 7th is a violation of our collective humanity and uh, despicable and should be condemned. And at the same time to as human beings acknowledge that the loss of civilian life in Gaza is heartbreaking. And uh, as human beings, we should be able to, to hold uh, both ideas. Uh, we've certainly been working to make sure that students debate issues of policy. What should the US policy be? What should Israel's policies be? Uh, what should be happening in Palestine that, and, and, the, and the territories? Uh, that those issues are, um, debated in a way that is calm and civil and respectful. Uh, it's been uh, admittedly a challenge to, to try to diffuse issues and also to make clear that our um, process of discussing these issues has to be consistent with the First Amendment. That is, uh, we have to be a place that values academic freedom and free speech and consistent with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which requires that we have campus communities that are free from harassment and discrimination. And I think sometimes folks have acted like you can't have both of those, and I believe you can. You can respect free speech and still protect against discrimination and harassment and ensure that our students feel safe. And you know that, that's, the, that's the, uh, the work that all of our campuses have been doing. 
Um, I really appreciate our, our presidents and our uh, student affairs teams and our chief diversity officers for how they've led through it. Uh, and it's hard and it's going to continue to be hard, I think, in the, in the months ahead because it's such a tragic situation. Well, um, okay. I'd like to ask about another hard issue that unfortunately we are, are wrestling with at the K-12 to level. And um, uh, that has to do with the fact that, as you know, legislatures in a number of states have passed laws that severely restrict curriculum, that ban books um, um, that students can have access to. Now, fortunately, we haven't had any such laws in New York State. But nevertheless, we've gotten reports that many teachers, especially social studies teachers, still feel chilled by this general atmosphere. So I'm just wondering, given your um, background, both as commissioner of education in New York State and as a social studies teacher, I mean, what advice can you give to teachers and to uh, our education leaders about how to promote discussion of controversial issues in the classroom in these very difficult times? Yeah, look, I, I think, first of all, I have to start with, uh, we should uh, honor the truth in our classrooms. And so I think policy leaders have to stand up to efforts to distort the truth about our history. You know, when folks want to erase the history of slavery or pretend uh, that um, there has not been a long history in, the, in this country of anti-immigrant sentiment or to ignore uh, what was done to Native Americans and the way they were deprived of the land, the, we have to reject those, those efforts to cover over or hide the truth. We have to grapple with the hard parts of our history. Um, you know, my um, great grandfather was enslaved in Maryland. And in three generations, my family went from enslaved in a cabin that's still standing in Gaithersburg, Maryland, to serving in the cabinet of America's first black president. And so there are two truths there. One is the truth, slavery happened. It was this horrific institution, a cruel institution, a, a, a abomination within our history as a democracy and progress is possible and change is possible in our society. We need our students to grapple with that. We also have to work to help students develop the skills to see issues from different perspectives and to listen carefully to each other. Foundationally, we need to make sure we're teaching the truth about our history. And then we've got to engage students in debating issues that are matters of policy opinion and helping them do that thoughtfully. You know, my, my daughters have both gone to uh, Montgomery Blair High School in, in Montgomery, Maryland. And both of them had an assignment where in ninth grade, they wrote an essay on one side of an issue and then in 10th grade, they had to write the same essay, but on the opposite side of the issue, arguing the opposite side. And I love that assignment because it was real practice in kind of thinking through the reasoning that would support either side of a particular issue. Um, and I think we have to get better as a society about kind of listening to each other and trying to see, trying to have empathy for each other. And that's part of, I think, how we cultivate those classrooms where tough issues can be discussed. Well, that's, that's really a, a very um, useful example. Um, you know, uh, one other uh, problem that we face in trying to teach civics at the, um, at the secondary school level especially is that many students from marginalized backgrounds um, uh, don't relate to our political institutions in America. They say, these institutions don't serve me, um, what do I need to learn about them? What do I care? And I, your personal history obviously um, makes clear that um, people from various backgrounds can overcome this, but it is a large problem for our schools, getting these, these students interested. Um, and I'll tell you from the other point of view, we have many uh, students who come from uh, the other side of the political spectrum who just reject a lot of democratic values. So how, how can teachers, you know, in these very difficult times, relate to these students on both ends of the political spectrum that seemingly have very little interest in the kind of traditional civics that, that you and I have known uh, and that we tend to talk about? But we've got to go beyond that traditional mm -hmm. civics 
to really get through to these kids. Yeah, look, I, you know, I think one of the reasons I so value service and public service is because it often puts students in a situation where they're, where they're working together alongside people who are different from them. And that can, I think, break down some of those barriers. In a classroom context, particularly in schools that are still, sadly, in this country, deeply segregated, uh, one of the challenges, how do you cultivate empathy for someone you, you have never encountered or are unlikely to encounter in your day to day? And I'll share with you a, a story, an explanation that President Obama once shared when we were the, with a group of young people. He talked about the power of reading to cultivate empathy. Because when you read a novel uh, or a memoir, you get to inhabit the world from the perspective of that main character or the, or the author of that memoir. You get to see the world for a moment through their eyes. Right? And, th and that often can be the way that you can start to break down some of the sense of fear that people have of the other because they start to see our common humanity. Uh, but I don't want to make it sound like it's easy. I think that is very difficult work, but it is important work to try to help our students develop that skill of perspective taking, you know, seeing the world through someone else's eyes. Literature can be very powerful um, for that. The arts can be very powerful. For, for developing that. And so we have to think not only about, you know, reading in the history textbook about the, the thing that happened, but trying to create ways that students can connect, um, you know, with, with their own humanity and the humanity of others. You know, on, on your kind of first point about students, particularly students from uh, groups that have been historically underserved or marginalized, feeling disconnected from institutions, that is real. And that is very difficult to overcome. I think part of what I tried to do when I, back when I was a high school history teacher in, in Boston and in Puerto Rico is to try to have students see the history of social change and the ways in which, despite the, all the flaws of our system, it could be made better. You know, when you read the letter from a Birmingham jail, you can't help but be struck by how effectively King grounds his argument, not only in the in uh, broader kind of history of Western uh, political thought, but specifically in uh, the promise of America that, that has been unfulfilled and the promise of democracy that has been unfulfilled. So helping students have that kind of exposure I think helps. Wow, that's a great, great example. Okay, we're running out of time, but I want to see if we can get a question or two from uh, from our audience. And um, uh, one one of our uh, participants has asked, how can SUNY better support pre-service teachers in colleges of education to be set up for success to teach civic education post-graduation? That's such a great question. And, you know, we are one of the major providers of social studies teachers for, for New York State. Uh, I think over 900 undergraduate uh, social studies teachers right now uh, being prepared, more than 250 at the graduate level. So uh, part of it is making sure that those teachers are prepared to structure these um, difficult conversations in the classroom, uh, teaching real perspective taking. But the other thing I would say is uh, this is not something just for the social studies and civics teachers. Uh, I think we've got to get better at SUNY and across the teacher prep sector at preparing elementary school teachers to teach history and social studies. Actually, we have a lot of evidence that students become better readers if they have that exposure to history and social studies in the earliest grades. They have that broader content knowledge, background knowledge. So we've got to make sure that we're preparing those teachers and we've got to prepare the science teacher when they're teaching about uh, genetics, there are all sorts of complicated philosophical, ethical questions they could raise. Or when they're teaching about um, climate change, all kinds of interesting, debatable questions about how we move forward as a, as a community, as a country, as a planet, to take that on. Okay. Um, all right. I think we have time for one last question and uh, another one of our um, listeners has asked, uh, well, first she said, narrow accountability policies push civic education out of the curriculum in many schools. Now it's trickling back in. What can policymakers, educators, and voters do to make sure that next time we're faced with a policy that goes against best practices in education, 
we don't lose important subjects like civics and media literacy. I think she's talking about the No Child Left Behind Act. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and look, when you know when we uh, replaced No Child Left Behind uh, during the Obama administration with the Every Student Succeeds Act, one of our key policy goals was to broaden the definition of quality education. Of course, we want students to have English and math and to graduate from high school, but we want more than that. We want them to have exposure to science and social studies and the arts and to be prepared to be good citizens. And uh, so ESSA allowed a broadening, which I think was very important. Um, I also think we have work to do to make sure that folks don't see social studies and civics as like an extra. It's core, it's foundational. It's core to what education is supposed to achieve. And, you know, even with, um, even with ESSA, I still worry that in too many elementary classrooms in particular, too little time is spent on uh, history, social studies, civics. Um, and so we've really got to work at, at the local level as well, you know, outside of federal policy, the local and state level to make sure that there is that emphasis on that, that foundational learning for students. Okay, well, thank you so much, Chancellor King. This has really been an extraordinary uh too brief conversation because your depth of knowledge and involvement and concern at every level of education really came through and we really appreciate that and i'm sure everybody watching thanks you for that but now we can move on <laughs> okay and i've got to it over to turn it over to cynthia at this point uh, hello everybody thank you so much um Good afternoon. I am Dr. Cynthia Sandler. I'm the library media specialist at North Salem Middle School High School in North Salem, um, New York. And I uh, want to say I very much appreciate uh, Chancellor King's remarks about reading and uh, all its importance. Um, my own work centers on supporting teachers in critical media literacy education, as well as teaching students to be critical consumers and creators of media. And I have the honor of introducing our panel of stakeholders from across New York State who will help us consider issues related to civic education, particularly in the midst of polarization and conflict. Beth Biscati has been a high school educator for 30 years, and she currently teaches history and government at Niagara Wheatfield High School in Western New York. She's a student-focused teacher committed to engaging students and helping her school meet the needs of its diverse learning community. Beth serves as co-advisor for the Student Council, Interact Club, and Take a Look at Teaching Club. She also serves on the school board of a neighboring district. Tracy Norman is Assistant Superintendent for Instruction in Lakeland Central School District in Westchester. From Montgomery, Alabama, he began as an elementary educator in the Montgomery Public School District in 1998 and was a longtime principal in New York before assuming his current role in 2021. Dr. Norman joined the Army National Guard as an undergraduate and was deployed overseas twice, once in 1990 to Saudi Arabia and once in 2004 to Iraq. He's still in the New Jersey Army National Guard and serves as Army Chief of Staff in the rank of Colonel. He holds two master's degrees and a doctorate in educational leadership and is an Army War College graduate. Chris Cabara is a sophomore at Murray Bertram High School in New York City. He is an active youth member of the Democracy Ready New York Coalition and a Why Vote Changemaker. He is interested in law, social justice, and civics. He wishes to pursue a career in law and strengthen his skills as an activist. And Kevin Feinberg is Senior Program Director for Facing History in Ourselves New York Office, coordinating support for educators, schools, and districts in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. He aligns Facing History's content and professional development workshops with local and state standards, including new efforts to improve civic education. He also works with the New York City Department of Education Civics for All team and New York City's Office for the Prevention of Hate Crime. Welcome panelists. So our overall question asks, how can schools ensure quality teaching and learning to prepare for civic readiness in this time of polarization? Chris, if we may start with you, from your own experience and perspective, 
what is particularly important about civic education today? I think civic education is very important for people, like for anybody, because it really empowers people to like understand their rights, responsibilities, and how to actively participate in like their communities, whether it's school, home, or workplace. Like for me, example is I didn't know that somebody my age could take part in my um, school in my um, home area school um, community board. And I feel like that's really important because some, it's important to know that someone like my age can make a positive change in my community. Thank you. Tracy, would you like to add on? Sure, good evening, everyone. So what I'll add is that we live in an ever-changing society that is constantly influenced by technology, current events, global events. And I think it's very important that our students understand that citizenship and the responsibilities of being a great citizen and how to contribute to our society in a positive, conducive way. And I think that's just the nature of, uh, of civics. Thank you, Tracy. Beth? Yes, hello, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, at the high school level, I think it is is so important to make sure that our kids understand how democracy functions and also that they need to be a part of it. If we've looked at the last couple of elections, the number of people who actively engage in voting is not, not where it should be. And so I think one of the problems we have at the high school level is a lot of kids see the um, social discourse or um, the the problems associated with um, the polarization of political parties, and they just say, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Um, so I think it's important for us to show them that how important it is to engage not only in our government, but also to engage in our communities. And we can do that by showing them that they have a voice, like what Chris said. Um, I've had students that had the speed limit reduced out in front of our school. I've had students who have done projects and they've seen firsthand that they do have a voice, even though they're 16, 17, 18 years old. So I think we need to give them the opportunities to engage so that they are um, growing in that throughout their life so that they become informed constituents. Um, I always tell the kids we can have, we can disagree without being disagreeable. We can mm -hmm teach the students how to um, how to talk with one another, even if they are on different sides of the issue. Thanks, Beth. Kevin, would you like to add? Yes, thank, uh, thanks, Cynthia. This is a, it's a real honor to be part of this panel. Thanks to the Center for Educational Equity. It's great to be part of Civics Learning Week. I also saw in the chat some folks were talking about teaching at Satellite Academy High School um, at Schomburg up in the Bronx. I'm a former teacher at Satellite at Chamber Street and in Jamaica, Queens. So just a shout out to Satellite and the old um, alternative superintendency of the New York City Public Schools. So um, my organization, Facing History and Ourselves, we support middle and high school teachers in New York City and New York State around the country and the world. So I'm going to speak from the perspective, I think, of, of teachers. And we all know, and this came out in the conversation between Michael Rebell and, and Chancellor King, that teachers are getting it from all sides, right? They're getting buffeted by social media, by politicians, by, um, uh, by their communities, by parents, sometimes by their own supervisors, superintendents, school boards. And I think often the messages that teachers receive, including from teacher education programs and professional learning, is to be safe, to play it safe, to play it down the middle, right? Uh, and therefore, education in these days, because it's safe, is often anodyne, right? It's it's name states facts. And yet those of us who are educators, we have to remember first things, right? Why we got into education, what schools are for. Of course, it's to help young people make their way, college and career readiness. But the reason why we're all here is for civic readiness, right? Schools, education, social studies, humanities. It's about helping young people navigate the world, including our democracy, to both be part of the democracy, to help shape that democracy. And that means giving teachers the support they need to not necessarily play it safe because history, civics, current events, 
It's about inspiration, it's about joy, but it's also about anger and sometimes even despair. And we need to work through that by giving young people the civic skills and dispositions to be, as Chancellor King said, to be human. Thank you so much for the, that introduction, everybody. Um, I'd like to, to follow up and ask you from your perspective, given your various um, positionalities, what challenges to civic teaching and learning have you seen or experienced due to our charged and polarized political and social climate? Uh, any examples um, and how it's impacted you or, or your students in district? Um, Beth, would you would you like to kick that one off? Sure. Yes. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the fact that when we're teaching teaching civics and teaching about uh, com communities and participating in your community, Niagara Wheat feels very unique to some um, other school districts in New York State because we do have. Um, we are on land that used to be the Holden or Shonley land. We have the Tuscarora Nation within our school district. So we also need to acknowledge that it is important for them to understand the democracy of the United States, but it's also important for them to participate in the government in which they belong. And so um, I just wanted to make mention of that as well. So some of the problems we have uh, in, you know, in this area, in our county, is it's a very, 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 very red area. Um, unless you go to the two cities in Niagara County and they're, they're not that big. And so I think what we see is a lot of kids coming to school with only one side of the story. And so it's important for us to be able to address that. Yes, this is what one party believes and this is what the other party believes. And what do you believe? And I think we need to give them the tools to have the facts and not just mimic what they might hear at home or what they hear on the TV, but actually give them the tools to be able to discern for themselves to the best we can, what is the truth and uh, how do they feel about it? And so I think that that is what I strive to do in the classroom, but it is difficult because a lot of times they don't really have the other side of the story. They're just kind of, um, you know, only coming from one point of view. Thank you, Beth. Tracy, would you like to follow up with that? Sure. So I, I certainly agree that that we are living in polarizing times. And I think what, what largely attributes to that is <clears throat> societies of diverse beliefs uh, particularly as it as it relates to equity, diversity, inclusion, uh, depending on a person's lived experiences, uh, they show up in our district uh, from various backgrounds with various beliefs. So one of the challenges that that I've been tasked with, or we're seeing, is is trying to bring all those different perspectives together, um, while while still respecting pe people's right to their own beliefs. But unfortunately, as a result of what we're seeing is that teachers and administrators are hesitant to introduce controversial topics uh, because of the polarization that exists in society today. Um, an example you know, that I'll share, uh, there are times when teachers are reluctant to teach topics that relate to certain parts of, of American history. Uh, I agree with Commissioner King that we, we cannot and should not erase your American history. But Topics such as immigration, uh, the voting process, and in many cases, uh, these these are being left out of your books. Uh, bottom line is teachers and administrators want and need to feel uh, empowered, and they want to feel supported by their leadership. Leadership meaning that their central office administration, their boards of education, and even up to the state level. But again, uh, sometimes you're with, with these different perspectives uh, crashing in one place, uh, that's just not uh, happening and teachers don't feel empowered. Thank you, Tracy. Chris, can you speak uh, about this from a student perspective? Okay, so I feel like a big issue is maintaining student engagement and participation. A lot of students my age feel like disinterested or simply just do not care about like politics, civics, and not and like not knowing what their rights are. And I feel like that's a really important topic to like discuss. Like I was a part of this project group where we were trying to get a lot of students and um, teenagers to pre-register to vote. 
And it was hard because a lot of teenagers just didn't care about voting. And that can really hurt them in the long run when they're 18 up and like, oh no, how come I don't know how to vote? And now I have to register to vote. When you could have saw, when you could have done the application process earlier and saved you some time. Thanks, Chris. Kevin, anything to add to this question? Yeah, you know, I'll build a little bit on what I said a moment ago. Uh, you know, at, at Facing History, I, I work with and support uh, all kinds of schools all around uh, uh, the region. One of the schools I, I've been working with recently, I won't mention the, the school, but it's a large school that that's in Brooklyn, a high school. And um, they have a student population from all over the borough. So from some of the most conservative communities to some of the most liberal communities, immigrant communities from all over the world, varied religious communities. And, uh, you know, the teachers are a little bit frightened and they're, they're a little bit paralyzed because whether they're talking about voting rights or January 6th or Israel, Gaza or Russia, Ukraine, or even, uh, you know, contested histories uh, such as the Armenian genocide, which at Facing History, we don't think that should be contested, but there are communities that do contest it. They get complaints and some of them are, are, are frightening complaints to them. And so, as I said before, they, they're trying to, to, to teach safely. Right, and it ends up being names, fakes, uh, uh, names, uh, you know, facts and dates that are more trivial than substantive, and it, they teach bromides. But the good news is they they turn to organizations and supports to say, wait, we, we how can we do better? And so it's really helping to remind them um, and to give them the support to say that the work that you do is about asking the hard questions and giving students what they need to develop those civic skills and dispositions. And I'll add one more thing, which is a, a bit of a contrast to that. And it's also a reminder that we, um, there have long been politically polarizing times in the United States. I know it's worse now than before, but I think back to um, a, a time in the early 2000s, polarized time, war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I went to a school with, with my Facing History hat on, and we you know, have, all, have long helped schools uh, give, uh, help teachers develop students' civic voices. And the teacher I was working with there was so proud of the work they've been doing. And this is an example of a school where the uh, student population and the teacher population were, were very like-minded, right? As opposed to the school I was just talking about where there was a real diversity of opinions. And this teacher really wanted to show off the civic work that they've been doing by showing posters all around the school of all the anti-war protests that they and their students have been going on. And of course, I, I had a, my own personal political response to that, which was, you know, my point of view was support, but my pedagogical response was very different. It was really asking questions about, um, are there places for students with a minority point of view of this, uh, of this to, to express themselves? Are there young people here who have family members in the military? And let me say, of course, that that could be a reason to join anti-war protests, but it could also be a reason to join support our troops protests. Was this work being done anthropologically, observing, listening, looking at the tools of change making and protest? Or was it simply, we're all in this together at a little bit of conformity and blind obedience? And those are not tools of, of, of democracy and civic disposition. Those aren't tools of listening and learning and being in conversation. Um, and so I think those two are some of the challenges we have. Um, when teachers are afraid to, to kind of raise the tough issues, and when teachers and school communities are so like-minded, maybe in deep red or deep blue areas, that they're really not practicing civics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in light of that, um, opening up to all, I, to what extent are current events or possibly those controversial topics still part of the curriculum in your schools and classrooms? Um, and what impact might that be having? Tracy, do you want to start us off? Sure. Well, um, they they both exist, but they exist differently uh, in my district. I would say our current events uh, they exist minimally. We we know that things uh, happen. You turn on the uh, TV, you see the news, you see uh, things happening, and we're we're not uh, that far from New York City, if you will, and and I'm sure that you can see the protests and those types of things. Uh, taking place. But we do have a curriculum that's, um, I would say, that's tightly coupled, and, and that's not by design. Uh, typically, we do have uh, pacing charts and those types of things that, that we uh, want our teachers to follow, and they, they feel compelled to follow 
and cover all the material. So when when things do happen in our society, um, I would say current events are addressed minimally because they don't have a whole lot of time to spend, and that's somewhat unfortunate. But uh, we approach it from the perspective of trying to uh, let kids think critically, uh, form an opinion, uh, and really support a stance and develop an argument. Now, controversial topics, on the other hand, which I see differently, uh, they largely exist, and, and they largely exist for different reasons, uh, based on the teacher's uh, ethnicity, gender. Um, I would say it may be a controversial issue to some and, and not others. I recall my experience as a principal uh, working in elementary school. Uh, I had recently deployed to the Iraq war, for example. There were people that weren't supporters of the war. And so me being a commanding officer in that war at the time, uh, that that left me in an awkward place to to maybe uh, display uh, military paraphernalia and those types of things. But I would say that that exists on a much larger scale uh, with our teachers in the classroom. And, you know, these things constantly change. Uh, that school I worked at was located right next door to a mosque. And we had a great relationship uh, for the 19 years that I served in that school. But now that we're seeing this war, uh, people are very sensitive uh, when you when you exchange uh, with, with Muslims, unfortunately. So I would say the overall impact are, is missed opportunities to promote a generation of civic minded individuals instead of just uh, passive consumers of knowledge. Thank you. I think your, your distinction between uh, current events and controversial issues was was fascinating. Um, Chris, from, from a student's point of view, um, what are you seeing in the classroom? Current events, controversial topics, what are you seeing? As of right now, my teachers don't really like to discuss controversial topics or current events. But before, I had a global teacher, and he used to make us write um, research papers on like current events that we found in our world and how it would impact our everyday lives. And I feel, I feel like that was very like educational and it really helped us like understand like different perspectives of our world and how like current events, like events really repeat themselves and how we can stop harm from our world. Thank you, Chris. Beth, anything to add on this? Sure. With my seniors, especially, I use current events a lot because I think it's important for them to be actively looking at what's going on in our country. So example, they might pick an article that deals with, you know, shootings, mass shootings, or, you know, and then we'll have a conversation and debate about the Second Amendment and about, you know, should there be more federal laws, most of the gun laws or state laws, those kinds of conversations. Um, if a kid, if a student asks me a question, I'm going to answer it to the best of my knowledge. Um, I think when, um, and again, I'm a 30 year educator. Um, so I've been doing this a long time. I can see where younger educators might be a little more fearful of approaching these topics, but I think when we ignore it or we uh, shy away from it or look panicked when a kid asks us a question, I think it makes them more uncomfortable and more unsettled because when you see an adult that is nervous about something, you're like, oh my gosh, I should be nervous about that too. And so I try my best to, you know, and to have those facts to the best of our knowledge and encourage them to look into the topics more. But I try to tie current events with what we're doing right now. We're doing the Bill of Rights. So, you know, find something in society today that would relate to the Bill of Rights, um, because I think it's important for them to see that our document isn't just a document. It's a living, breathing, um, you know, flexible document that's lasted 250 years. Beth, and let's, let's continue on that thought. What advice would you give to your peers based on your experience about prioritizing civic readiness? Yep. So I'm also a coordinator for the Seal of Civic Readiness for our school, which we're really, really um, pleased to offer to our students because it offers them the ability to not only explore things that are important to them, 
um, but also be more engaged in their community, either with service learning or um, a capstone project. Uh, I was just at the New York State Social Studies Conference presenting uh, last week, and um, I really liked this, and I'm going to borrow it from my friends at Chictawaga Central. Um, instead of calling it a capstone, they called it a passion project. And I absolutely positively loved that term because the kids pick an issue that they're they're passionate about. And then they decide how they go about um, finding more information. And are they going to do a website that's going to help the community? Are they going to write a letter of informed action? You know, what are they going to do to make their community better? I also really... Um, coming from a school district that has a Native American nation within our school community as part of our school community, I think it's really important to acknowledge that they are an autonomous nation and that they do have their own government that is different than the United States government. They have to understand, I said, you have to understand the other side. You know, what if you have to enter into a treaty uh, with the United States? But I think it's really important, especially in schools that have indigenous populations, to acknowledge that they have a government and they have a language and culture and traditions and that they can help us make ours better by, you know, by uh, being part of our community. Thanks, Beth. I so appreciate your perspective on that. And Tracy, what would you tell other administrators? Well, for starters, I would, I would encourage them to understand the importance of civic readiness as it relates to our current society. Um, empower teachers, students, and parents to promote civics you know, through the lens of problem solving, critical thinking, um, and really just being responsible citizens. Uh, sometimes we, we place emphasis on the actual topic more so than uh, where the focus should be on trying to solve your know, problem with it. In terms of administrators, uh, I believe they should remain cognizant of the fact that the communities they serve are, are very diverse. Uh, they're diverse educationally, socially, and oftentimes we, we forget about you know, our parents. Uh, when we do the initiatives within the, the walls of our schools, uh, we should really take the time to educate the parent communities and not just solely focus on the uh, teachers, you and the staff. Thank you, Tracy. And Chris, back to you. What would you tell your peers, your friends? The biggest piece of advice I could give somebody is just to educate yourself, like know your rights, know your responsibilities as assistant, know democratic processes, know the civics around you to be a really active citizen and use that information to like encourage your friends and encourage the people around you to be, to advocate for positive change in our society. Well, no doubt you are a role model, Chris. Thank you for that. So one of our final questions asks, what do district and state policymakers need to know? What supports and resources would help, would help you, would help all of us? I uh, think, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I, I'm sorry. Um, I think uh, the commissioner said it very well or the chancellor said it very well when he said that we need it at all levels. It seems like in the past 20 years, we really have shied away from focusing on uh, civics and history at the elementary levels and even at the middle school level. We lost our seat exam in the middle school. Um, and so to support us, I think they need to support schools to incorporate civics and history all through the grades from pre-k all the way up through 12th grade so the kids can have those building blocks and there's very easy ways you can do that without per se having you know a social studies lesson um you know you can do it by having mock voting and there's so many different ways to incorporate it into what they already do and i think that's the biggest thing that we need to tell educators is that you're probably doing a lot of this stuff already, especially for the seal of civic readiness. And you can tweak it and make it into something that I think will make a lasting impression on your students for their entire life. I still, the girl who got the speed limit reduced on the state road in front of our school, which nobody said she could do, um, she still calls me and she's like, that was one of the, my proudest things I ever did. And so that to me 
is participation in government. That to me is civics in action. And I know for I know that she will be an active citizen for the rest of her life. Sorry about that. Thank you, Beth. Kevin, what do you think? What's you know, before the I answer question? that, I wanted I wanted to actually echo a little bit about what Chris, what you just Great. said. You um you didn't say it quite in this way, but one of the things that was kind of implied in your statement is that schools and teachers, um, you know, have an opportunity to help young people, uh, you know, take control over their own education because you you kind of put it on the on the backs of 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 young people to say, hey, you know, you, you know, educate yourselves and and take responsibility and to learn. Now that is the responsibility of schools and teachers, but we're successful when we when we have you know. When we give young people the tools to also, uh, you know, take the reins for themselves and 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 make their own learning happen. So thank you for saying that. Uh, to answer the question about uh, district uh, and state policymakers, you know, I know I'm I'm a broken record here, but you know, um, when when folks respond to critiques by trying to play it safe, or by and I think uh, Tracy was saying something like this earlier by trying to defend a curricular component. Or say, but look at all these resources where it's in the state curriculum. Um, and, and there's a place for that. But I think they're already losing. And it gets back to what I said before about kind of remembering first things about school and education. I think, you know, my role in a professional learning organization, but all of us here on this, on this event, to just give our leaders, uh, remind them, give them the ballast, the backbone to just say, hey, school is about helping young people navigate our democracy and to find their way in diverse workplaces and diverse colleges. Uh, and that means allowing them a chance to be in the messy and to be human and to have hard conversations. History is hard, literature is hard, science is hard. It's all about choice making and morals and ethics um, and to learn how to build consensus and to listen to someone you disagree with and to stand up for what you believe. And that's in contradiction to building coalitions sometimes. Um, to be able to convince someone using evidence-based sources or evidence-based um, arguments and to be willing to be convinced yourself. So to just to remind our leaders, that's what school is about. That's what education is about. So bring parents into that conversation that we're not teaching students what to think, we're giving them the tools, how to think and how to make a change and you can help shape their minds and at home. We're going to help shape them in terms of being in the world. There's the line, isn't it? It's not. It's not uh, what to think. It's how to think. We all have probably said that a hundred times, all of us. Um, uh, uh, let's see, um, Tracy, would you like to give a weigh in on what supports you think our districts need, given that our our Policymakers are some of whom are here. Uh, of course, um, what I would say, um, in a nutshell, is that we have a problem. I really want our policymakers to know that we have a problem, and this problem stems from many factors. Um, we know that things are happening outside the state of New York. When teachers see librarians getting arrested for having certain books on their shelves or people look within New York State and see teachers being uh, ridiculed uh, for teaching or addressing certain topics, uh, they are reluctant to teach. And that is a problem. Uh, we, can, we can assume that, hey, we can tell them we support you and those types of things, but the truth of the matter is um, they are reluctant to address topics. And I, I think state policymakers need to know that. It's a problem, it's a complex problem, and it needs to be framed to, re to reflect the perspectives of all the stakeholders. And we want educators at all levels to feel empowered uh, to teach curriculum and address current trends that are affecting students on a routine basis. Uh, what supports we need? Uh, from my perspective, uh, the support would include designing policies or laws to protect all educators, administrators, and teachers from defamation without stifling the First Amendment rights of others. Um, I know that's complex, but I think that would that would help tremendously. Here, here. 
And and Chris, is there anything you'd like to add for this question? Um, anything policymakers like you can give them advice on? I feel like a lot of it is about funding, like the lack of funding, because us students, we're forced to like educate ourselves because there's a lot of a lot of the time there's not going to be somebody who's going to go up to you and try to teach you civics so i feel like the reason why we have to go educate ourselves is because there's a lack of funding of like civic education programs and civic education curriculums in our schools and there's like little to nobody like teaching us we have to go teach ourselves and i feel like that's a big issue that's like not really talked about a lot. And Chris, can might you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in these civics organizations? I think that um, you're you're just a really exciting role model for and 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 a really neat perspective for all of us watching to hear. What have you done? How have you gotten involved? And um, where did this interest come from? Maybe something is done. different for me because me personally, I'm interested in civics and I do see myself pursuing a career in law. So I guess it was just like, oh, let me go learn more about law and civics and how this stuff really impacts me. And joining programs like DKNY really like helped me have a huge understanding of the civic world and how like I can make a positive change in my society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. So our, our in our the time we have left right now, I do want to end on a on an uplifting and positive and and um, um, point. I'm wondering if anybody would like to contribute um, as a final comment, what gives you hope? Beth, you shared a, an example of that student, something yeah. like that. What, where are we going from here? What gives you hope? What gives me hope? With is, some light, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. What gives me hope is that if you have passionate educators who believe in them and uh, present the material to them, they will rise to the occasion. Um, I've got girls that have uh, been working on a project in school and they are so excited that it's actually coming to fruition and their classmates are coming up to them and thanking them. Um, you know, it's just once they see that, it just kind of sparks something in them. I think the other thing we need to do is make sure we support all of our students in our school community. So I said, like my indigenous population, um, I have a student who wrote, wrote his letter of informed action to a clan mother and um, we're in the process of hopefully getting some grants from New York State. And um, he is so excited about doing um, service learning in his community with his community members. So I think um, if you're excited about it, it will spark something in them. And I think the other thing that has really helped in my district is we've been working on building community within our school district and working on using restorative circles. And I have seen a huge shift in the way kids are speaking to one another and that they're pausing and taking a look at what's coming out of their mouth before, you know, uh, before it comes out. And um, I think it's made it a lot easier to have those conversations. So I would encourage, um, you know, districts to look into how can we look at empathy? How can we look at building that community within our school and within our classroom so they feel safe to come in and have those conversations and they can disagree without being disagreeable. I always say, let's have some courteous conversation and they rise to the occasion. So I, you know, I can't say enough about um, giving them the opportunity to show us that they um, are a bright generation and uh, hopefully will take care of all of us when we retire. That gave me hope. Tracy, bring us some hope. <laughs> Well, I have uh, lots of hope, and and I will say, you know, we, we talked about uh, some of the problems and issues on this forum, but there are way many more successes uh, within my uh, local community uh, than than challenges, and I say that wholeheartedly. Um, you know, similar to uh, to Beth, we do have the uh, Civic Seal of Readiness. We uh, recently incorporated that in our district, and 
and I'm proud of that. It's in both of our high schools and our teachers and administrators are doing great work and our students are benefiting from it. I would say forums like this gives me great hope. Anytime we can have stakeholders come to the table and talk about your know, issues and, and share knowledge uh, and exchange information, that's always a positive. Um, I can't say that um, that has always been the case uh, in certain situations, but to know that uh, you have people or distinguished members that are serving on this panel and this forum are uh, willing to listen and talk and, and I would certainly uh, expect that they're going to take this information and act on it. Uh, that's very hopeful. That's very encouraging. I mean, here, here, if I could, sorry. Yeah, uh, go, if go. If I could just jump in. I mean, yeah. to be part of this uh, important and remarkable event, um, I thank you to my co-panelists, but also the, 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 the whole summit here. Uh, there are really good people doing the hard work. Uh, it, from my perch, Facing History is getting a lot of requests from schools and districts for folks to say, help us do this work, not help us run away from it. Uh, tomorrow uh, in New York City, there is a citywide conference that uh, Chancellor Banks has put together uh, called Meeting the Moment for all city principals. And uh, they're doing this work. They're talking about how they can actually not hide or run away from these problems, but it, but embrace the difficult conversations. Facing History is playing a small role. We're giving, we're giving the principals some tools, but it's a citywide effort. And, you know, there was a lot in the news over the past months, month where the where, you know, city leaders could have said, uh oh, and in, instead they said, hey, we got work to do. Let's do it. And that gives me hope. Chris, any last words? You are our hope, so <laughs> bring it home. I feel like I do have hope and I have hope in social media because social media has been like a huge platform for like students and teenagers like me to like really show off their activism. And it's like been a really good platform for people who don't really know a lot to like learn from other people who try to educate on that platform, on those platforms, like X, Instagram, like it's so easy. Like you could just repost and print information and a lot of people will see it. And I feel like it's a great platform because a lot of teenagers feel like they have to be higher ups or big or government workers to really show activism. Yeah, yeah, to what extent are you, uh talking, using and using social media in education or learning about it, Chris. It's a, it's a, that's a controversial topic unto itself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know like how controversial it is, but I personally think it's a good platform because I've seen a lot done through social media and through educating others and how well it works because everybody, like nowadays, everybody's on social media. So might as well target people who are on the platform because a lot of teens aren't really interested in going outside and like, oh, I want to learn civics. But they, but now a civics post just randomly popped up and they can just swipe through it. And Chris, I don't mean to keep putting you on the spot, but we would love to hear what you have to say. Um, we have a question from the, um, the the audience wondering how you and your classmates talk about the relationship between things that you read and see online and things that you know are happening in the government. I feel like that ties in to like current events, like how we use current events to see like how history repeats ourselves. Like me personally in our my global and ELA classes, we talk a lot about like serious issues we read in our books and serious issues we read and learn about. Like right now we're learning about oh the World War II and how though and how there was a lot of serious topics that are still being repeated nowadays. Really insightful, Chris. Um, we're just about out of time. Is there anything uh, anybody else feels that they haven't said or would like to convey before we move on to the next panel? Everybody feels, feels good? Okay. Well, I would like to thank you all for your wisdom and expertise and willingness to share your experiences representing everybody from students to administrators to outside 
organizations doing such important and great work. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, and um, panelists, please um, stay for a question and answer discussion after our next panel. We're going to come back and have the opportunity to talk with um, the policymakers. So I would now like to welcome Professor Jonathan Collins, who will start the next panel. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Professor Jonathan Collins, and I will be moderating our next panel uh, as a part of today's uh, Civic Week activities. Um, this is our policymaker panel, which I'm particularly excited about. So as a quick introduction, I'm Professor Jonathan Collins, new to Teachers College. This is my first uh, semester teaching here at Teachers College, Columbia University. Uh, I am a political scientist by training, PhD in political science from UCLA. Uh, I've been studying school boards and school governance for about a decade. Um, my work focuses on the uh, role of democratic innovations and strengthening the democratic nature of school boards, thinking about ways to increase participation in civic engagement, and as well as with the focus particularly on getting minoritized populations to be, um, to have easier access and more participation within school decision-making processes. I've done work on participatory budgeting. Uh, I've done all different kinds of work that center around parent and student engagement. So I'm very honored to be a part of this discussion uh, today. Um, I'll, we can start by introducing the panelists uh, very quickly if they can uh, hop on. Right. Um, and then we can get to what should be a, a, a really riveting uh, discussion that I'm excited to just see take place. Right. Um, let's, I'll start by introducing uh, Jay Warona. Uh, Mr. Warona is the Deputy Executive Director and, and General Counsel for the New York State School Board Association, which goes by the nifty name of NISBA. Uh, NISBA is a, uh, which is a member of the Democratic, of uh, the Democracy Ready, I'm sorry, NYC Coalition, NY Coalition. Mr. Warona is responsible for representing uh, NISBA and his membership of approximately 700 school districts, quite massive. Uh, Mr. Warona served as the chair of the board of directors of the National Council of School Attorneys in, in 2007. This organization represents the interest of school lawyers throughout the nation. He also serves as an adjunct professor at uh, the School of Educational Administration and Policy Studies at the State University of New York at Albany, SUNY Albany. Uh, Mr. Warona also successfully argued and won a case before the United States Supreme Court uh, involving separation of church and state. So we're quite honored to have Jay Warona with us here today. Thank you, Jonathan. Great to be here. And I'll next move on to Jeff Madison. Deputy Director Madison recently joined the New York State Department of Education as the Senior Deputy Commissioner for Education Policy. Mr. Madison's career spans 35 years as an educator in Vermont and New York beginning as a social studies teacher and assuming roles as an assistant principal, a principal and ultimately superintendent. He recently served over, as over, over a decade as the district superintendent of the Tompkins Seneca Tiago Board of Cooperative Educational Services. Working with counties in the Finger Lakes slash Southern tier regions of New York State. So a wealth of experience as a policymaker, Jeff, honored to have you. Good to see you, Jonathan. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Senator Shelley Mayer, who has represented the 37th Senate District in Westchester in the New York State Senate since 2018. In 2019, Senator Shelley was appointed to serve as the chair of the State Senate Education Committee. She's been a champion for children and families with a strong commitment to K-12 K-12 education throughout her career as an attorney and assistant attorney general and New York State legislator. In 2023, Senator Shelley introduced and passed legislation to encourage youth civic engagement by ensuring schools provide students with an opportunity to pre-register and register to vote and requiring all school districts provide high school students the opportunity to participate in student government. She's previously introduced legislation to create New York's uh, civics core programs, 
to place high school graduates in state government jobs and to help uh, build the next generation of public servants. Previously, she served in the New York State Assembly representing the city of Yonkers, New York State's third largest city. Senator Mayor, honored to have you here. Thank you, Jonathan. Honored to be here. Thank you so much. So to, to jumpstart the conversation, you know, this is a, a this is a very uh, special group. And I think a lot of us are really curious as to uh, your pathway here. And so, you know, as a political scientist, one of the things that I remember uh, observing in graduate school was that uh, the state level has to be the most uh, underutilized and understudied entity. Um, there's no media coverage. There's local media, there's national media, but it's hard to determine what's going on at the state. As a result, the state level ends up being a bit of an enigma. Yet the common thread amongst you three is that you have dedicated such extensive amounts of work and labor to pushing through uh, different kinds of um, policy related change at the state level. So just could you each talk, a, a spend a minute, very quick cliff note version of your journey to becoming um, a state policy involved actor. And we'll start with, uh, with, with Deputy Commissioner Madison. Thank you for the question, Jonathan. Um, well, it's when you start a career in education, um, you always wanna have as much influence as you can, especially when you start seeing wonderful things happen with students and starting with a social studies teacher, as being a social studies teacher and having great activities of, you know, doing mock trials, um, putting uh, projects together where students are debating important issues at the time. And then you move up into uh, further roles. You heard my administrative career. And then when I became a district superintendent of ABOCES, you have a connection with the state education department. You work directly for the commissioner. So you get a little exposure to the statewide effort when it comes to policy. And then most recently, I served on the Blue Ribbon Commission on Graduation Measures. And coming out of that work, uh, the commissioner and I made a connection for me to end up coming here as a senior deputy commissioner. So part, I was part inspired by um, looking at a different way of doing high school education. And certainly, um, civic readiness is part of that, as one of those proposals was to make it uh, closer to being a graduation requirement rather than an alternative experience and a, just a part of social studies um, curriculum. So um, that's kind of how I got here and uh, kind of how I got in this seat in this um, particular webinar as well. I love it. So you, you started with more of localized problem or seeing civics as a, a localized problem and you build from there. Mr. Warona, how about you? Yeah, so I decided a long time ago, um, it's a couple of years ago when I was a kid, that I wanted to be a lawyer, uh, but I always knew um, that what I wanted to do was to really dedicate my career, um, if I was lucky enough to have one, uh, to moving the needle on social justice. Um, it is, you know, it deeply disturbs me to see the injustices in our society. Um, so um, I got into the whole uh, arena of public education because, of course, I think everyone listening in today is, is spending time listening in because they they know this is the only hope that we have uh, for democracy. So, um, you know, I've dedicated almost 40 years so far uh, to this enterprise, and um, there's not a day uh, that has gone by that I have not been proud to uh, represent this this entity, uh, you know, we're not always perfect, right? We don't do everything exactly right, but I, I know that our education system does exist um, to provide all students with an opportunity to rise to their highest potential. Uh, and that's what this is all about. Very passionate answers. Senator Shelley. Uh, so for me, when I was in the first place, I really am not an expert in education. I was fortunate to represent the city of Yonkers and the city of Yonkers, the biggest issue during the time I was in the assembly was the fact that their schools did not have enough money to provide truly a sound basic education in the way that the Court of Appeals said in the pivotal CFE case, and that I knew these kids deserved. It was fundamentally a, a matter of equity for a city that was not adequately funded. And so I became an expert or not an expert, I became knowledgeable about the state's funding of our public schools. And I would say to the parents, don't get tired of going to Albany because half of your budget comes from Albany and you cannot 
as long as you care about these kids, you got to keep fighting for this money. And so I became knowledgeable. And then when I ran for the Senate, I think the leader um, recognized that I had this combination of an urban districts, the knowledge of an urban district and the need, the equitable needs of our, particularly our poorer communities, as well as I represent a suburban community and I'm on the border with New York City. So I had many of the combination of skills that I think she thought were necessary to be an advocate primarily focused on two things. One, Jay said, our schools are the pathway for our democracy. They are the true beginnings of and, and the, the strength of our democracy. And secondly, they, they still represent some fundamental inequities that we can only cure through the state's policy changes. So I've been a very strong advocate with my colleagues here uh, focused on equity. And it it's not an, a fight that's over yet. <laughs> well, this is interesting. So the common uh, a common theme that is emerging, especially between what you're saying, uh, Senator Mayor, and what Mr. Wor Warona is saying here, is that well, the 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 desire for uh, a more equitable system is one of the main drivers that propelled you into this work, and that has motivated you to sort of continue to sort of fight the good fight. I'm curious as to um, what other blind spots or what other gaps uh, do you see when you look at the landscape of civics education within the state of New York? And we can circle back and start with you, Mr. Madison. I think as far as blind spots is, I think we don't realize um, because we're people do their job in education, the kids come, they're trying to follow their curriculum, do as much as they can with them, uh, get to know them as best as they can while they're in the classroom. But we haven't been able to really take the time to take stock of who we've silenced over the years. Are they seeing the kind of uh, people that look like them? Do they interact with curriculum that's about them? Do they learn about histories that they can connect with? Do they get to read books that are about them, about people they care about, the subjects that they're interested in? Um, so I think our blind spots are we look at the present and we're kind of worried about preserving what we've got and we haven't taken the time to say, OK, what's still missing? You know, do we have to go back and rebuild some things in our libraries and our curriculum to make sure um, students have access uh, to their people from their cultural heritage and with their history? Because we, we have one thing and we're, we're even a much more diverse state than we were even 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And we can't add content fast enough without encroaching on other areas and people want to defend the turf that we've got right now. But we need to be open uh, to having a little more flexibility so students get what they need. That's interesting. So the idea of really bringing uh, the curriculum to life and making uh, the, the learning experience more personal, more deeply tied to the identities and the experiences of kids of like, really adding the, a full three-dimensional aspect to the way in which we approach the teaching of civics education. Mr. Warona, would you would you like to add anything to these? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think in terms of a blind spot, it, it, I think probably everybody listening in today is a supporter of civics education. I, I don't think they'd be listening in if they weren't. But I think one of the blind spots has been that um, in public education, many times we expect our educators um, to, you know, teach uh, in, a, in, in a manner that uh, provides all of those wonderful critical thinking skills to our kids, but I'm not sure we do enough to support them um, when it comes to um, you know, dispensing um, educational opportunities for kids that would relate to critical issues. So we were really pleased, the New York State School Board Association was really pleased to partner with Democracy Ready. We're a very proud member of this organization to come up with a policy that um, we have uh, provided to every school district in the state. It's entitled Teaching About Controversial Issues. And it basically, um, in, in essence, uh, places a board in a position to either choose whether it's going to encourage and support discussion on controversial issues or whether it's going to allow them as uh, as they arrive in the normal course of instruction. But it, it places the educator in a position, if this, so, if this policy gets advanced, that they know they're going to get support um, in advance from their administration. Because you know, we can't get to a place where kids 
critically think. Um, if we can't have them critically think about topics that are, you know, marginally or very uh, controversial, um, you know, you, you really can't, um, you know, critically think about toast or cereal, right? So, so the, the point here is that um, I, I think that's a blind spot that we, we need to make sure that we are protecting those educators from the angry mobs that could be coming to a theater near them uh, by perhaps, and many times that they're misinformed. Uh, about what has taken place in the classroom to begin with. The teacher really didn't do anything inappropriate. And, and, and I'm not suggesting that there are no teachers that, that are engaged in activities that are inappropriate. That, that does sometimes exist, but much less than people might, might otherwise think. So I think that's a blind spot that we should get to. Uh, so when we've arrived at the elephant in the room, which is the idea of discussing controversial topics. Yeah. Uh, I'm particularly, you know, thank you, Jay, for putting that on the table. And I'd really like to build on that conversation. Uh, Senator Mayor, you've uh, had quite an interesting legislative record in a very good way. So we've talked about your the legislative record of advancing youth civic engagement. You also have pushed a bill that is uh, looking to equip local institutions, school boards with uh, more training to be able to handle some of the increased pressure that has come along with this discussion of, of controversial topics uh, in the boardroom, could you talk more about like what what motivated you to take this approach? What are what are you seeing, and how how big of a problem is this uh, for not only just civics education, but thinking about the education landscape more broadly? How concerned should we be about what's happening with uh, all of the political contestation? I think we have to be very concerned. We need people to step up and be willing to to run or be appointed, whatever the governance model is for their school boards and not necessarily parents of young children. We need a whole range of people. I always say that people whose kids are not in the public school system need to be fully engaged in talking about education uh, because it really is central to our communities locally and, and, and bigger than that. So one I saw during some of the height of this political pushback that board members on boards of education were really not prepared for sort of the political wins. Like I'm an elected person, I am I can go out and get yelled at, that's my job. You know, I run for office, people don't like me, they disagree, That that I'm fine, I'm up for that. But they thought they were being on a school board. It was sort of gonna be meetings and nonpartisan and everything would go along merrily. You could have reasonable disagreement. And then they got caught in this firestorm. So two things happen. One is I believe we need to give them the support as Jay was talking about giving teachers to be able to sort of toughen up in a reasonable way and say, you know, this is the environment we're in. I got to stand up for something that I believe is best for our schools. And at the same time, they are entitled to as much education and training about the laws and the policies that they are subject to. So those are two areas. Also, I am working on a bill to, uh, allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote on school board elections. Uh, I want to encourage student ex officio members on school boards, which some boards have. I want to make the voting for school boards occur in the physical community where the majority of parents live. In some of the communities I represent, the, the election is in a place of the affluence in the community, not where the majority of minority parents who send their kids to the public school. So we have to reinvigorate the process by which we've sort of, we, we have this sort of out of date school board model, in my opinion, that we need to reinvigorate as part of not only civic participation, but ownership and investment in the public school model. Wow, wow. that is an extremely powerful uh, response and statement, thinking about not only um, fielding the attacks that have been coming along with the new kind of politicization, those sort of repoliticization of education, but actually fighting back with deepening the, the, the sort of democratic nature of institutions. How can we figure out how to make the school board elections, for example, more participatory and more equitable and more uh, locally centered? Um, this is this is phenomenal. Um, so uh, I love the fact that we're also steering towards these more solution oriented approaches. And I wanted to pull this out and tease this out a bit more. And so, you know, I love a good magic wand question. 
And so I'm really curious of, you know, from, especially from your uh, policy or legal lens or vantage point, but especially given like your expertise and the, the power and discretion that you have with your various positions, if you had a magic wand to wave and, uh, and therefore create the kind of civics education policy infrastructure or system within the state of New York, what would what would be some things that you would prioritize? What would we what would you sort of envision for us if had if you were given this sort of power responsibility or sort of mythical power? Let's start with you, Jeff. I think the number one thing I learned in the past year on the Blue Ribbon Commission was how vital it is to have seamless opportunities for young people to communicate with policymakers. In other words, if I had a magic wand, I'd have an easy way for us to be able to listen to the landscape of public education of all of the students so their ideas can get up through us. Now, even Senator Mayor had some great ideas for getting participation from students. That doesn't mean all their ideas will be able to prop up. So thinking of linkages between student governments and schools and their local school board, student governments and schools and their local town board, because they, they, we bring them all into one little community and they have to self-govern to get through a day and we have adults to help manage that. How do we increase student voice so that it goes all the way to the top so we can create the best kind of policies that make their voice heard and also creates the conditions where they have agency when they leave with an education. You got an educated young person who also believes that they can make a difference in the public square when they leave our schools. And I think the most important way of doing that is hearing what they have to say about it and then have intelligent adults think about it, process it, propose the best ideas, work with our, our legislative officials and our governor to create the best policies behind that. So I think one of the best things we can do is to be good listeners in our positions and integrate the best ideas that we hear from young people and those people in our local communities. I love it. Tightening, these, tightening, tightening the communication linkage between everyday students, kids in our schools and in our communities and the policymakers who make decisions that influence and shape those schools. I love it. Jay, would you like to- Yeah, like I guess to my magic wand would be to, um, we, I think we need to acknowledge that school boards and in fact educators you know, need to serve as exemplars um, for our students in terms of what constitutes uh, appropriate conduct uh, for engaging in, in you know, public discourse. And I think, you know, at the height of COVID, when a whole bunch of people were upset about like everything in the world because the world seemed to be ending, and, and I get that. Uh, but it, it, as uh, Senator Mayer said, you know, they came uh, with their, um, their you know, um, upsets to school board meetings, and, and that wasn't necessarily um, anticipated uh, by individuals who just wanted to be altruistic and serve their communities. But I, I think the magic wand to me is to provide a skill set for boards of education. We're working really hard on that, um, as well as educators, in, in terms of what really constitutes civility. In other words, if you and I, Jonathan, had disagreed with something, something uh, you know, and, and let's face it, that this world is so divided politically, but we, we have to be able to mirror for our kids um, what is the appropriate way of engaging in that discourse. And if we don't do it, if we start screaming at each other and using foul language or whatever, what, what are we teaching them? This sounds so basic, right? But I, I think that is a, a thing that we really need to be focusing on um, so that everybody in this type of situation, um, in every arm of government, um, or educators themselves really need to be those exemplars for civility. I love it. The idea of leading with civility. I thought you were going in another direction, which is you never want to argue with a lawyer. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know what I always say, though? I, I say that people are entitled to their own opinions, but not their own set of facts. And that's where this whole conversation that we're involved in fits in, right? Which is to let people know that if, if we're going to debate right now how, how lousy it is outside because it's raining and it's actually sunny, that's a stupid argument, right? So we really need to make sure that we're we're engaging in what constitutes the facts, and then let's have both sides of it. So we got we have uh, uh, leading with civility, tightening tightening the link between uh, between policymakers and kids. Senator Mayor, 
anything you oh is there something that you would like to add in terms of your magic wand what would we, what would we expect from that <laughs> well unfortunately my magic wand goes beyond schools and it really has to do with okay. cynicism about politics and policy and the role of government and, you know, in the years that I've been involved in elected life, in which you face this head on from regular people who don't believe that anything you do is relevant or meaningful or that anyone cares about them. And unfortunately, that's become the dominant climate that has led to this sort of ugly tone of politics and policy. And I don't mean politics in a partisan way, but, you know, being engaged. And so I find that students take on all of that a uh, feeling of cynicism and irrelevance at a very young age. And it's our obligation to try. And I don't think we have all the tools. And this is why this is a very important conversation. We have to try to switch that around, to have at least more kids believe that they're growing up in a society in which their voice will matter and that they have a role and they have a voice and they have um, the ability to make change. I mean, I think that is what this original discussion of sound basic education, which you know, so many of my colleagues were involved with, was about having people become adults who would participate in our civic life. And so we have to deal with the cynicism part in a much more straightforward way. I don't have all the answers, I have some ideas about it, but that would be my magic wand. No, I, I think that's such an important point to bring up. I mean, there's already a, um, a a psychological hurdle or a barrier to participating in politics and civic affairs already. I mean, I use the, this metaphor in my class of thinking about how, you know, we don't have kids engage in this activity and then suddenly they turn 18 and we expect them to vote. And it's like, we don't do that with anything else. We don't ask them to just like never drive a car and then suddenly get in the car and start jumping on the highway. You know, like we, you get a learner's permit you get exposed, you get the opportunity to get behind the wheel, you get familiar with the rules of the road, and you build up a certain kind of muscle memory and an anticipation for being behind the wheel. And you know, why aren't we doing some similar things uh, with voting and with civic engagement? And it seems like that you, Senator Mayor, with the, the legislation that you're putting forward, you're sort of addressing this more systematic problem. But I think you're right as well in that it takes more than just changing things systematically, but we also have to change the way in which kids are thinking about these processes and the signals that we're sending to kids on how they should be thinking about these things. And I think that's a perfect segue too to another question, uh, especially given the audience that we have uh, here in attendance. You know, if, if you were speaking to a version of yourself that was, real, that was uh, a part of an organization out in the community looking for ways in which you could make some sort of meaningful change uh, for strengthening our education system, but really strengthening the fabric of, of, of civics education, what would you recommend? Where is a young activist supposed to go? Where is a, a community organizer or a member of an organization that is part of our NY coalition supposed to go in terms of taking steps to advance um, you know, something meaningful and something useful. I, I, I want to go back to you, Senator Mayor. Well, it's a great question and, and it's a provocative question, which is good for me because we, when we became the majority in the New York State Senate and obviously the Democrats were the majority in the assembly previously, we changed the laws about pre-registering to vote so that 16 and 17 year olds could pre-register to vote in anticipation of their 18th birthday. And what then we did a bill, which I sponsored, which you referenced, to uh, basically tell schools you have to cooperate with boards of elections in actually facilitating this. Because what I saw, and it's a credit to the League of Women Voters, and I know they're part of the coalition, communities that had a League of Women Voters were already in schools pre-registering students to vote. But communities that didn't, including some that I represent, those kids for some reason, even if they were interested, didn't have the opportunity. So it was necessary to sort of say schools, this is another thing you have to help us do. You have to work with our board of elections to get students involved. So I think the ability to pre-register is something very specific that community can do. 
and students can do on their own. They don't need anyone. They can just work it out to get schools to pre allow students to be registered, pre-register. The other is for students to form clubs and organizations that speak with a voice about issues they care about. Because there is this sense that students only care about, uh, you know, the things they might like, TikTok or whatever. But there also are lots of students who care about these social issues. And there should be an opportunity for them without hesitation to have the opportunity to talk to other students about it. So I believe in uh, clubs and after school and community organizing. And certainly for me, as someone in electoral life, for students to engage in electoral politics, if they're interested and find someone they like and want to help. Wow. These seem like very feasible, low hanging fruit things that could be done right now. It, it, what, what, um, Mr. Warona, JR, do you have this sim a similar? Yeah, well, you know, I, look, I, I I think that Senator Mayor, I mean, she knows I'm like a big fan. So um of, of her and her and her thoughts. Um, you know, at a local level in a school district, you know, policymakers have some choices to make about how they're going to practice democracy as opposed to just teaching about it. The example I can come up with is, you know, after those horrific shootings in um, in um, the shooting in, in Parkland, Florida, you, you may recall um, a lot of those surviving kids had urged kids all over the country to have a walkout. Uh, and to protest guns, et cetera, which became a big political issue because some of the folks who, of course, were adherents to the Second Amendment were very offended by that. And there were some school districts that decided, you know, that we're going to bar the kids from walking out for safety reasons. That made all great sense. But there's others that said, hey, let's use this as a teachable lesson. Let's let's let them not walk out necessarily. Let's support them in having a, a real conversation. We'll give both sides of the equation, right? That's what's, what about the Second Amendment? Uh, what about about where we are right now with school, you know, with, with violence and, and and guns, et cetera. So kids could have their voices heard. And my point simply is that I think there are choices that school districts get to make on a day-to-day -day basis, regardless of what the legislation may be in terms of encouraging, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, students to become more um, actively engaged. And and I, I'm just saying that I think that districts need to think long and hard about what this enterprise really is about. Uh, is it about you know, dis dispensing education in the classrooms, or is it really dis you know dispensing uh, democracy? And I think it's the latter, uh, in addition to the education piece. So that that's just my my rantings in in terms of that. <laughs> well, this is interesting, and and if, uh, well, it makes me think of so one consistent critique that we find is that you know people don't think that um, that kids are capable of doing these things that we sh we can't entrust kids to make decisions around who should be on their school board or um, kids to make decisions around what kinds of um, policy pursuits that we should be um, making at the local or state level. How in the world can we trust kids with such a, a heavy and weighted responsibility? I'm, I'm curious of what you all have to say to, to this critique. Uh, Jeff, we'll, I'll start with you. I think we can trust kids because they're going to inherit everything we pass on yeah. to them. And, you know, we, we really don't have, first, we don't have a choice. Second, we sell them short way too often. I mean, it's really incredible solutions that young people can come up with that an adult can't. We're all, we're, we're locked in to the way, to a way of thinking once we get to a certain age in many ways, at least a majority of us are. And we need people looking at it from a different perspective. The other thing is um, they know what their friends are wrestling with, what their friends' families are wrestling with. There's a, they're a source of intelligence that we don't have access to. So I think for me, it comes down to we don't have choice. And if you're not taking advantage of what they know and what they're capable of, shame on you, really. Um, and really, our job as adults is to help them be less focused on a problem and more on the solution. That's where we need the most help. We're just as good as them as identifying problems. Uh, we're good at that. But uh, I don't think we always have the most creative solutions, and I, and I trust that they will. I have a lot of faith in young people because um, I see how much energy they bring to things. I see how much they care about other students and the things they go through. They, they're the ones who are exposed to much more diversity than we ever were growing up 
um, in the school. And so we need to ask for their solutions to problems that we've never experienced in our lives. Jay, from a legal standpoint, right? Well, how would you respond to this kind of critique, right? Well, because one argument is that, well, we set the, in, you know, Senator Mayor's bill is pushing up against this. Well, we set the, the voting age at a, at a certain level for a reason. There are certain assumptions that we're making about what a kid is capable of um, once they reach the age of 18 and beyond. Why in the world would we start to sort of tear down these barriers that we've constructed to ensure that we have uh, citizens who are making decisions that are of a certain quote unquote cognitive development st uh, stage? Yeah, I guess I, I, I had to have to just agree with Jeff uh, uh, in the sense that um, I, I think high, more highly of our students than that. I think our job as educators um, is to support them in their journey to critical thinking. Um, I think there are a lot of people who will say, um, uh, you know, in, in some political sectors, uh, particularly during the pandemic, that schools were indoctrinating students into liberal ideology. And, 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 and most educators said, you know, that's nonsense. It has nothing to do with whether you love Democrats or hate Republicans or vice versa. You know, I've often said, we've often said that we're trying to turn out the most conservative Republicans and the best liberal Democrats and everything in between. We have no dog in that fight. We want kids to be able to critically examine, you know, what constitutes their political truth. Right. So so I, I don't think that we should have, you know, some litmus test for what what that age is. I think the education system really needs to be um, not only motivated to, in, you know, providing these critical thinking skills, but. Also making sure that our communities understand that is what we exist for. And that's the only thing we exist for. It is not to foist, you know, political ideology on our students. I think that was perhaps the most offensive charge that educators um, and legislators were receiving. Um, and again, that's not a political comment on my part. Uh, it's just, it's just, it was just not true. Well, so this makes me also think about the stakes. And I think that's kind of been an underlying theme of the last few responses that you all have given. But I, I want to really sort of corral um, that idea into something very pointed here, which is what's at stake if we don't get this right? You know, thinking about I, I want to start I want to start with you, Senator Mayor, because you're, you're pushing legislation to try to get this right. And I'm curious of like, well, what's at stake here if we don't? What happens if we don't make any progress on civics education, if we don't do anything to advance the, uh, the propensity for a youth civic and political engagement? You know, what's that, what, what's, the, uh, what's the counterfactual? What's the parallel universe look like when we don't do these things? I think the risks, and we're all highly aware of it, is that we have a generation that does not engage in the civics of our community, of our democracy, you know, whether it's local government, whether it's hearing about the library, whether it's protesting something, these aspects of American democracy are extremely dependent on having a robust civic engagement. Now, civility, which we've been using that word too, is part of the conversation. It's slightly different, but as we've lost civility, it's become harder for people to be willing to run for the school board or run for the library board or voice their opinion because the anger and the intolerance is so high. So I think we have to, we run the risk of people sort of going into their corners and not engaging in a world in which we are dependent. We are so fortunate. I tell students all the time, can you imagine that in Russia, when you put flowers on Navalny's grave, you, you were taken into custody. We live in a country where you are allowed to demonstrate. You are allowed to put flowers on someone's grave. You're allowed to stand up and shout right outside my window here about what you think the legislature should do. But if we are going into our corners, into seclusion, into shutdown mode, because it's too hard, we don't know anything about it, nobody really cares, it doesn't really make a difference, we, we run the risk of losing the essence of our democracy. So for me, it's... It is that important 
uh, citizenship plus civility. They have to be merged together in our conversation. And there's many things we can do beyond what we've discussed here today, but I do think it's a very risky for American democracy for everyone to go into their corner and stay home. That we're not gonna do well that way. That's incredibly That's dangerous. The idea that we would pretty much dissolve into a society that lacks true civility, where people are unwilling and unable to talk across their differences, to communicate with one another efficiently and effectively, to be able to solve some of the problems that come along with the ability to communicate with one another across our differences. That's that's very concerning. Jay, do you see this as well, or are there additional? Yeah, I, I don't think it's hyperbole to say it could be the destruction of our democracy if we don't learn how to not talk at each other. You know, I'm a little bit more optimistic um, about the fact that I think we can pull this together. I, I have to feel that way uh, because we have to we have to keep trying, right? Uh, and that's what I think this conference is all about uh, is, as well. But I do believe that Senator Mayor is 100 percent right. If we don't if we don't get this right. Um, it's going to be um, it's it's going to be the end of democracy and and it's not as though this country has not disagreed in the past you know I think I think where we are right now is social media which is a very different animal than we ever had before and I it's it's what I was saying before people are making up their own set of facts and that's what people are debating over right so so that's we we have to have media literacy skills that people understand what constitutes something that's not true versus something that is and let's bring on the debate. In a civil way, uh, but let's not uh, let's not debate uh, things that are just not true, uh, because that's where I think the destruction um, exists. Well, you know, this opens up a conversation too that um, I'm I'm not sure how deeply we want to delve into it, and uh, we also want to make sure that we leave time for Q and A. But there's this thing that everybody keeps talking about called AI, artificial intelligence. And obviously, one of the biggest concerns with the ease at which we are able to create things through AI is that, well, are we is do we risk losing a commitment to ensuring that things are real, and especially that um, different kinds of media content is produced that it is actually factual. Now we've been uh, living in a period where. The legitimacy of the press has been under attack. The legitimacy of media and of accurate information has been under attack. You know, think what are the implications for a civics education in this particular environment? Are there things about the sort of looming fear of AI and maybe the looming opportunity of AI that are impact that impacts the way in which you're thinking uh, about civics education here in New York? Uh, you know, Jeff, we can we can go back to you. I'm um, I'm glad you asked. Um, I think my <laughs> my biggest fear in AI really is not the ability to manipulate large groups of people because I think people are sophisticated enough that eventually the biggest fear is apathy. They won't mm -hmm. believe anything, and then when they don't believe in anything, they don't stand for anything. And when you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. That's a pretty common phrase. And if you drop out and you don't participate be because you come too cynical, because you don't believe what you're seeing or what you're hearing, it's too easy for a small group of people to take control and just bring on a lack of democracy where they're calling all of the shots. So the danger to me is the lack of trust people will see with anything. So my encouragement is for people to engage in AI for where it's useful, use it as a tool, um, but have healthy skepticism, but not so much skepticism that you're not gonna believe anything uh, that you're receiving from people that you trust or for a trusted source. Um, but trust, trust but verify is the, the old uh, term we hear as well. Um, I have more hope of AI than I do fear, but my, my fear is over cynicism <laughs> and apathy as a result. Uh, Senator Mayor, is there anything you would like to add? Are you e as equally optimistic uh, as Mr. Madison here? Well, I, I share that I'm not, I'm not afraid of AI, but I think one thing that we saw during COVID, and I've seen it in my travels around the state and schools, is that 
kids uh, related less to each other and the phone becomes their, their major tool of communication. They're spending their time on the phone, not talking to other people. And I think the more we encourage the interactive human part of school and life, uh, you know, there'll be a balance with AI and people will be able to determine what is what is accurate and what is false to Jay's point. But I found that I went to schools where, for example, they had empathy lessons. They had right. lessons in learning to say good morning in the younger grades to every kid in the class and not leave anyone out. There are some of these social interactions that we need to, to counteract the desire to completely put all your interpersonal faith into this little phone device. And I think uh, we need to reinforce that. And then there will be a balance with AI. I, I agree with Jeff. I think we'll, we'll get that straight ultimately, but not if we don't encourage the human interaction, which is the best judge of, in my opinion, sort of what's true and false. Is, that is inspiring and, and uplifting. That's, uh, that makes me feel better. I was, I am admittedly pretty uh, concerned <laughs> about everything with OpenAI and ChatGPT, but uh, you, you're right. But I'm also concerned about um, our kids talking to each other. Are they interacting with one another? Are they building substantive and meaningful friendships and relationships? I am gen genuinely curious of how this generation will respond to these challenges and, and the certain opportunity to navigate these things with or without AI. Mr. Warona, do you have any uh, any thoughts very quickly on the... Uh... Yeah, just real briefly, I, I think it's all about, you know, media literacy. I also think that there is some role for for government, um, particularly the federal government, to to really ensure that we don't expect Meta and some of these other companies to police themselves. I think we have to, you know, we, we have to decide as a society that, you know, um, we need some protections and it has to be in the law. Um, and we can't just have these hearings in which we, you know, uh, get mad at all of these corporations for doing what they're in business to do, which is to make money. Right. So th that is, a, to me, is an antidote for that. Um, but but I do feel like Jeff said and like Senator Mayer said, I, I you know, I don't want to fear technology. First of all, I think kids would mock us if we did. Uh, but secondly, um, I, I think technology can be used for very good things. We just have to figure out, you know, how we can harness those good things and and make sure people understand um, how you know how they can be used for for evil. That's very true. And you know, like it or not, the kids are going to be using these new technological innovations. They're going to be more literate and in. Uh, in and competent with these tools than we are. So, you know, we better embrace it or or, or, or else, uh, honestly. And so let's uh, segue to, to there's some questions uh, that have been put on the table that I want to direct uh, to you as panelists. Um, the first question is uh, about um, job security for teachers. Uh, and so uh, do do you feel that educators are becoming more and more at risk of losing job security when they teach or refer to controversial issues in schools? Is the tenure status uh, enough for professional autonomy or unnecessary for teaching uh, uh, or, re or referring to those issues? Like how much of a concern, I guess, uh, to get at the, cent the center of this question, uh, should teachers be about job security, given the, the political climate that you all have, have outlined? And I, I think Jay is sort of, Jay and Jeff are in the middle of that. We, we, I think to the extent that we can encourage school boards to have courage of their convictions to do the right thing and teachers to do the right thing, you know, that we we can't get sidetracked by the loud noise against teachers and librarians, which you're not mentioning school librarians who have been very yes. much on the forefront of this problem. They actually get lots of complaints about books in their library. Uh, but I, I, yes, we need to be concerned about it, but that's why we need good school board members and good superintendents. I think that a lot of educators, um, beyond Jonathan, to your question, whether they're going to lose their jobs, I think, you know, younger people um, are probably more intelligent than 
my generation was, which is <laughs> they, they're looking for, you know, a lot more satisfaction in their jobs. And if they don't feel supported, uh, notwithstanding whether they're going to lose their jobs, they may not stay in that profession. So to Senator Mayer's point, and, and as I indicated at the outset, when you asked me the first question, and I, I talked about this policy that we developed, you know, to, to really try to provide some comfort to our educators so that they when they're, when they're teaching and getting into it with their kids, they don't have to feel as though, you know, um, angry crowds are going to be there, you know, protesting them at the next school board meeting. Uh, but I'm not sure they would necessarily lose their jobs as easily as that. I haven't really seen that, to be honest, here in New York State. Uh, but I but I have seen people's um, extreme upset over uh, not feeling supported. And that I think we, we need to do better. Well, I want to pivot us in in another direction too. And so one, it's good to know that there that there uh that there aren't these uh overarching fears or that the fears aren't permeating through every aspect um of our policy apparatus here in the state of New York to where there should be these uh immediate visceral fears of um of teacher termination and teachers being receiving punitive responses for the things that they teach in the classrooms. I wanna welcome the panelists from the previous panel uh, to our discussion here and um, pivot from thinking about, well, um, you know, from teachers being safe to thinking about uh, rewarding students. And so um, one of the things I'm sure you're probably very familiar with is uh, the uh, seal of civic readiness uh, here in, in New York. It's a, um, it's a, it's a concept it's a uh, a tool that the the Center for Educational Equity we have been very um, aggressive about uh, championing and looking to expand. Um, and what I'm curious of like what you as a panel think about the idea of just some form of um, indication for success around civics education. How important is it to have? Whether it's the the seal in and of itself or some other um, marker or indicator of proficiency in civics education. You know, would anyone like to sort of jump in and talk about the importance of having some sort of quote unquote seal of approval when it comes to proficiency in civics education? Or I, I, I'm a, I'll be in professor mode and I, I like to call on people. I'm, I'm the call out person. <laughs> Oh, and you are and you are muted. So Beth, I'll, I'll start with you. Okay, um, I am somebody who is coordinating the seal for my school. We're we're piloting it this year, um, and I think it is the best tool to help us show the kids that their voice matters. Because when they pick those projects, when they do those activities, and they see positive change, they see our representatives responding to their to their letters. Um, we have been very lucky. Uh, Assemblyman Morinello, Senator Ort, um, Assemblyman Norris have been very responsive to our kids as well as our local levels. And they've actually seen projects come about. And so I think that SEAL encourages that. It's, always, it's also a pathway for graduation. I know there was a question about special education and making sure that um, our students with uh, special needs get the same um, quality education and civics because they'll participate in government too. Um, the SEAL is vitally important because it's accessible to everyone. Um, you know, all of their accommodations, everything that they have in school to make them successful can also be used for the SEAL. So it could be a pathway to get um, more kids um, literate in, you know, um, civics, but also more kids increasing our graduation rates. So we have, there's a clear sort of practical benefit. We're just thinking about students matriculation through secondary school and mm -hmm. like increasing the uh, amount of students who are qualifying for high school graduation and ensuring that the as students are qualifying for high school graduation and walking across the stage, that they're moving forward with a certain level of proficiency in civics education. Are there any other uh, components that folks would like to add? I see uh, uh, Dr. Salmon. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm like totally chomping at the bit here um, because in addition to 
all of our discussion, rich discussion about civics education. Um, I think we also need to acknowledge really more clearly um, the connection between media literacy education. And I appreciate uh, Mr. Warner, your, your comment specifically about media literacy education, because the issues of trust and apathy and cynicism and worry about AI, everything that everybody is saying, the very ability to participate civically stems from an understanding of uh, knowledge and skills to navigate our complex uh, media landscape. This is media literacy education. And we need to teach students how to uh, access, analyze, evaluate, create, act using all media. We need them to ask critical questions about the relationships between power and information um, and who is producing and distributing media. And we need to to um, teach them to evaluate the quality of the, and the significance of the news they receive. This is media literacy education. And by the way, this goes for teachers too. We teachers need this help. Um, and so I, I applaud the legislation that is currently um, being proposed. Bravo, New York, and also catch up to other states, New York. Um, but it's great stuff to that that on on the docket to build professional development uh, opportunities to prioritize library media specialists K-12 to um, think of some sort of standards for media literacy education for the state of New York is critically, critically important. So um, please pass this legislation. <laughs> Well, it's really interesting too that the, the different dynamics that you raise, and because in, and that's what makes this moment particularly critical when you think about media literacy is because social media has enabled us to not only be consumers of media, but we're also now producers or we can be content creators. And I say this as a person who feels way more important than he probably should when he yeah. shares stories on his Instagram account, right? Like <laughs> it's far too easy. <laughs> right, to be, to, want, to be one who circulates media, to who produces media, uh, as, uh, as as easy as it is to also be someone who consumes media. So I, I, I'm curious, Chris, what you think and like what your experience has been uh, with media usage and how you argue or how you believe that we should be inter integrating and fusing our media habits, especially youth media habits, uh, with uh, thinking about civic and political action? Well, based on my experience, um, my use of, the use of media has been really effective, but I see what the concerns are and I have seen like misuse of like media to use like to promote activism. But in my experience, I was a part of this passion project called Just Spoken and where we released newsletters on Instagram. We had an Instagram account and we would release newsletters about like public information about the college process and how and current events. And that really helped like educate people about like simple issues that's happening around. And I feel like it was really effective because a lot of people learn new things that they should or should have already learned in school. Well, interesting. So this can be a very, this can be something that very much supplements the educational experience. Now, a, a question I'm curious about too is the reach of this. So, so Senator Mayor, we have this idea of you all as policymakers that you are, that you sit in your legislative halls and chambers, that you uh, deliberate and adjudicate all different kinds of sophisticated matters. How much do you in do you sort of see things that are going on in social media? How much does social media creep up into the discussions that happen at the state legislature, in committees, or in conversations with colleagues? How much has social media shaped any kind of the uh, any aspects of the policymaking dynamic, especially over the last few years? Well, it's reshaped the political world, and we're political people. You know, we run for office and. Uh, Social media has completely changed the way you you are seen in your community at home, the people you represent, and then therefore here on the policy level, yes, it absolutely. You know, we take a vote, 
or we debate a bill in today I was in two committees where there was lots of debate and that'll be you know criticized on social media which is fine that's sort of a, probably a very effective legitimate use of social media but there's plenty of falsehoods there's plenty of ins insults you know i think it certainly has impacted both the political and the policy and i don't think you can separate them because we're elected officials who our interest is going home and going to the schools in our district. We don't spend, you know, we spend some time here, but our life is about, if we care about schools, seeing what schools are like. And so you can't let social media drive the whole thing because you, you'd be very misguided about what ordinary students and schools are doing, which is extraordinary work under very difficult circumstances. You wouldn't know it if you only read social media. Interesting. Tracy, I'm curious from your from your level, from your vantage point, from your lens, how has social media impacted the way in which you engage with students, with with kids, with community members and stakeholders? Um, in, in multiple ways, it it has certainly um, you know, enhanced our communication. Uh, we've been able to to push information out, not just uh, post information, if you will. Uh, but it's finding that balance in terms of um, what's important. We don't certainly we don't want to overwhelm the community. But I, I like to take a step back. More importantly, I don't think that the social media uh, is a bad thing in and of itself. I think it's it's the skills you know, that we teach, uh, the behaviors, and how we actually uh, use it. And you know. You see things, unfortunately, um, within our district where uh, choices are made that really give social media a bad perception within our community. And then there's different degrees of, of experience and knowledge with using uh, certain types of uh, media that, that we have available. And I think that it has had just a tremendous impact on, on our ability to do things and move our district forward, particularly uh, promote learning. But overall, I think that it's had a positive impact. This is good. I mean, the the fact that there's um, relative consensus on this, and coming from different uh, from different lenses and different vantage points, um, this is very promising and optimistic. Kevin, Mr. Feinberg, is there? Would you like to add how is facing history or just your? your yeah, no, thank you. I, you know, just to add, uh, thinking about this from a historical perspective, you know, this isn't the first time that media has had both negative and positive changes on the world, you know, from the printing press to periodicals to the phonograph to movies. Um, you know, some of the histories that, that you know, my organization works on includes the fragility of democracy, looking at the uh, Reconstruction era in the United States, where, where media and images of, of stereotypes and false accusations about re what Reconstruction was or wasn't impacted the collapse of an expanding democracy and the rise of Jim Crow to looking at how uh, in a burgeoning progressive democracy in Germany in the 1920s, um, a, a group in that democracy used the tools of the democracy and of media to destroy it, namely the Nazis. So this is the latest iteration of the, the power of, of media, of tools to give everyone a voice and uh, for that voice to be abused and misused. So it's the, so the lessons of that history, um, of all those histories, I think would be very useful for educators to bring into the classroom uh, so that young people can look at the, the tools they have at their disposal today and the risks of those tools. This is, this is an important point to understand that this double-edged sword that we sort of hold in our hands with social media, this is not the first time that we've held it. This is not new. This is a new iteration. This goes back to the discussion that you all were having at the previous on the previous panel about the need of the need for teaching, uh, using history to help us better understand uh, current moments, and uh, I mean, that's something that could also sort of transpose into the way in which we think about policy and policy making, learning from the ways in which we've handled different moments policy wise as instruction for how to sort of um, establish parameters around some of these new uh, innovations that are emerging. I think we're, 
we're bumping up against the ceiling of time here. I think we have time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, I think the I'd love for us to kind of tell uh, to tail this off with conversate with a conversation around actionable steps. I think that's a very easy conversation to have, given that there have already been a number of actionable steps that have been placed on the table throughout our dialogue together. But I'd love to just clearly st stipulate, OK, all right. So we have these concerns or these issues, Dig digital media literacy, um, maintaining uh, civility, civil dialogue, civil leadership, um, making our institutions more accessible and more participatory, especially for, for our young people. What are some actionable steps that you would recommend us taking starting tomorrow, getting up out of the bed, scrolling social media, then we get to work, right? What are some of the things that we should be thinking about doing? Um, Jeff, I'll, I'll start with you. Easiest thing to do is to be a model of civility, uh, especially for the adults on the call. If if we're not setting that example and they don't see us able to handle those type of tough situations, we're being, we're being asked tough questions and, or challenged for a policy or whatever, and we can't answer it without being cruel or give a nasty remark or whatever, um, then we haven't done our job and cynicism will uh, expand. So I think you wake up every morning, no matter what you see on social media or the criticism, is being a model of civility is a first step. Having a uh, setting the tone with being a uh, with with uh, being a role model, in the words of the great Michael Jackson, "Man in the Mirror." <laughs> Doctor uh, Doctor Sandler, anything you want to put on the table? Actionable steps. Actionable steps, start asking questions. Start asking questions about everything. Who's behind this information? What is the evidence? What do sources that I trust say? Find out how to use lateral reading, the skills of lateral reading to evaluate the credibility and the bias of information. But I would just say my one thing, ask questions. Interrogate. Uh, Ms. Pazatsky. Yes, uh, my mantra in uh, when I'm working with my teaching club and and just in general, my mantra is love what you teach, but love who you teach more. And you can do that by showing them what civility looks like, how to have those conversations. And when you see them not doing what we would like, have the courage to stand up and say, OK, how can we work through this? Because that wasn't OK, because Sometimes, you know, we, we don't know where they are coming from outside of a school. We just have them during the day. But if we can be a safe adult for them that shows them what civility looks like, then hopefully it'll combat some of the stuff they see on TV and some of the things in our community. Having the courage to pursue understanding. Oh, Mr. Norman. I would say, you know, the first step would be to raise the level of awareness. Um, I think it's important you know, for us to to really teach and promote you know, those civic values. Um, but you, before you can do that, you know, people need to be aware of what they are and more importantly, understand them and not just read them on a sheet of paper or on some screen. But what do they look like in action? Um, I think that's step one. If we can really get people to understand uh, what what our values are, I think that transcends whatever we're trying to accomplish. Uh, if we can promote good behaviors, uh, then we can have people that can be responsible in media, in classrooms, in the democratic process. I, I think it just transcends. Uh, so I would say raising the, the level of awareness and, and really identifying what, what are those values of civics that, that we want people to reach for. Well, identifying and really practicing the kind of value-based um, civic engagement that we that we want to see, uh, Mr. Kabara. Know what you're talking about, because one something that Dr. Sandler touched upon was like the miscommunication and like misunderstanding 
because it's so easy to like read the the heading of an article and just believing everything what the article says. But unless you know where their sources are and where they're getting this information on, you could be easily influenced and that you can then tell other people lies and miscommunicate miss and you can like tell other people like things that aren't true which is so you have to go into the article and like really learn what they're talking about and do your own research yeah <clears throat> don't take for granted that it takes work to be right it takes work to be knowledgeable we can't uh, uh, look at this as as a passive as a passive activity Mr. Feinberg. We have to have the backs of our educators and school leaders. There are a whole bunch of folks for a long time now making a lot of noise to pressure school boards and politicians and school folks about what they should not have in the classroom. And for us to just be able to say to our local school districts and school people, we support civics, we support civic readiness, we support critical thinking skills. We, we support young people being asked to ask questions and to look at challenging but relevant things. They got to hear from us too. So we got to make some noise. So important. In a, in a moment where there's so much attention around the contention, we have to continue to encourage kids to pursue uh, quest, lines of questioning, lines of inquiry, to continue to be curious, uh, uh, even in this moment where we're not sure how people respond to the idea of open dialogue. We can't let that get in the way. Mr. Orona. So I guess my takeaway is democracy exists to give us all a voice. And we actually have to do the unthinkable, which is to exercise that voice, right? Um, and I, I, you know, for the folks listening in, uh, don't say tomorrow, because yes, what do we do starting tomorrow? Don't say I'm only one educator, I'm only one student, I'm only one citizen, I'm only one legislator. We all have to understand we each have a, a very instrumental role in preserving this democracy. Um, and again, uh, it's not hyperbole. I think we're at that particular place where we need to understand uh, back to what uh, Senator Mayer said before, thank God we don't live under Putin. Right. And we have to we have to use our voice uh, in a most the most constructive way possible. And I was going to say I was going to use that excuse. So I'm kind of upset that you're taking it away. I am. Just one teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're you're right. You're right. That like a part of it is just the mental project of understanding that like rubber meets road. And it's important for us to engage in these kinds of things. Um, Senator Senator Mayor, uh, take us home. <laughs> well, I don't know about taking home. I, I'm in the world of pragmatic politics and policy. I can only do incrementally what is doable here. But as an advocate, you know, we all have our job to do to make these incremental changes to improve this uh, attention to these issues. And today you've really raised them. I know, you know, I, I push ahead one little push at a time. And that's, you know, that's the nature of the job I have. But each of us have the opportunity to push ahead for incremental change in whatever our settings are. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to have this collective voice that we all can do better on this. Thank you yeah. for, for being such a good uh, mentor in this conversation, Jonathan. Oh, well, this has been an honor to just be a part of uh, such an en enriching conversation. I feel inspired. I've come away with things that I just wanna practice just as an everyday citizen. Um, that I think could contribute to strengthening the fabric of civic education uh, here in the state. And I think one of the things that this has reinforced for me is something that I try to um, reinforce with my students, which is that this idea that democracy is a verb. Right? Like we settle on this idea that like we live in a democracy. We think about democracy as something that we just are sort of a part of, that we dwell in. And I think the spirit of this conversation has just underlined the idea that like, no, it is what we do that makes this a democracy. It's how we discuss, how we engage in conversation and dialogue with one another. It's how we treat one another. It's how we think about the idea of how, uh, how we should, how we should each be treated by one another. Um, it's about um, the way in which we communicate. It's how we use new technologies. Uh, it's very much an idea rooted, rooted in action. 
uh, and, and, and important behaviors. And so it's been an honor to be a part of this conversation. Again, I believe we're being recorded. And so if you missed this conversation, uh, there will be an opportunity to revisit it. Um, I hope that we can have uh, another dialogue like this uh, together. I learned a lot. Uh, I think the larger community who watches this conversation uh, has learned a lot and will learn a lot in the future. Uh, it's been fun. <laughs>